Right. So, so the topic of the of my lecture, which is also can, can be called my life work, since, since I've been working on this for the last uh, 40 years today, actually, since I started, 37 years since it was published, and so on, has to do with the realization in the last several decades that there is something really very, very amiss with our understanding of uh, the workings of galaxies, of galactic systems, and in fact of the universe at large. And this realization came about as follows. Right. So it has to do with the following, that people have been uh, mapping the gravitational fields <laughs> of those systems that we are talking about. They did this by measuring accelerations of test particles in, in those fields. And of course, accelerations are balanced by gravitational forces. You cannot really ma uh, map the full field because you need those test particles to be around. You need to be able to measure them and so on. But uh, let's say people have been uh, at least uh, mapping parts of the gravitational fields of these systems on one hand. On the other hand, they've been uh, measuring the distribution of matter in those systems, of visible matter from which you can calculate the gravitational fields. Of course, we have Newtonian gravity and relativity when needed. You can calculate gravitational fields, then you compare the two. And the fact is that they do not match by a large factor. And that has given rise to those anomalies, also known as the missing mass problem, the dark matter problem, and so on, to which, indeed, the mainstream solution is the presence of dark matter. But my own solution is very different, as you will see. So what, what sort of systems are, are we talking about? We have, for example, this here is, uh, happens to be the Andromeda galaxy, but it looks very much like our own galaxy, as we, we, we see it from within. And uh, so you can use test particles such as gas and stars in the galaxy, measure their accelerations, and so forth. There are also elliptical galaxies, lots of them. Uh, th th this is the whole uh, so-called local group with our galaxy here, with our biggest neighbor Andromeda here, and lots of small dwarfs uh, in here. Uh, you can then use uh, the, the, the companions to, to map the gravitational field of the Milky Way. You can measure the relative motion of the two galaxies to measure the, ga the mass of the whole, the acceleration of the whole group. You can also zoom in into this one of these or any of these small, uh, tiny specks here. They look like this when you do zoom in and you study their own dynamics inside. There are also systems of galaxies. There are, there, there are clusters of galaxies containing thousands of galaxies. You can apply your dynamics there and so forth. OK, so in slightly more detail, what, what is being done? So uh, as, as I'll tell you later, the, these are important systems, uh, spiral galaxies afford perhaps the best way to, to test these ideas. They are flat, thin systems in which the uh, constituents are in uh, almost circular motions. We understand the motions very well. And you can, you can determine the circular motion in those galaxies. OK, sorry. Uh, the, the circular motions as a function of radius. You plot it, you call it the rotation curve. From the rotation uh, velocities and the radii, you can determine the accelerations. And so you can at least map very well the gravitational field just in the plane of the galaxy. It's difficult to measure it outside, but that should be enough. There are also systems like elliptical galaxies where the, the constituents, mainly stars, move every which way, so in a rather random way. But that too tells you something. Some galaxies are enshrouded by a, <coughs> uh, a cloud of, of X-ray emitting hot gas, which supposedly is in, in a hydrostatic equilibrium. So if you measure the temperature run in them and also the density run you get from the you know, equation of state of uh, an ideal, ideal gas, you get the pressure uh, profile, and that gives you the gravitational field. And in all those examples, what you use are test particles that are part of the system themselves. They are bound to the system. But you can also use unbound test particles, such as photons. So light, <coughs> light that is coming from a distant source passes on its way near the galaxy to be studied. And from the way the light is bent and from the way the, the, the image of the, of the source is, is distorted, you can learn about the gravitational field of this intervening uh, intervening object. So this is what you do on one hand. You map the gravitational field by measuring acceleration. 
Okay. It just takes time. And on the other hand, as I mentioned before, you, you measure the you, you measure the mass distribution in the in the in those system, be it galaxies or, or clusters. And the main constituents of the visible mass are uh, stars, of course. So you measure the light coming from the star, the distribution of light, and you, you have to convert this to mass in stars. We know how to do this, more or less, using some conversion factors. Then uh, those systems also contain cold gas, mostly in the form of hydrogen with a small uh, helium admixture. We know the ratio. We can we can. Uh, by measuring light emission from uh, line emission from from the from the hydrogen, it's a very good measure of the mass, and we get the mass distribution. And then there's, in some cases, as I already mentioned, there, are, there is hot gas, which can also contribute to the gravitational field. You, you take all this, you get the mass di distribution. You use Newtonian gravity to calculate the, the acceleration field, and what happens? Yes. This is what happens. <laughs> All right. It just takes a little time for some reason. Okay, so what happens? They don't agree. And they don't agree by a, a large factor. So this is a slight summary of this. Um, so the, the, the statement is that galactic systems are held together by gravity balancing uh, so-called so inertial forces, which means that measured acceleration should agree with the gravitational acceleration. You measure acceleration on one hand by, by you, you really measure velocities. You don't measure acceleration. I mean, they, they happen on, on very long time scales, unmeasurable, really. You measure velocities, and you just convert them to accelerations. Uh, you assume Newtonian dynamics. This is the example I gave before. For example, when you do this for these galaxies, you measure the <coughs> rotational speeds uh, as a function of radius. V square over R gives you the <coughs> inertial force. Uh, you calculate uh, GB, which stands here for the uh, G is the, acceler the gravitational acceleration produced by baryons. I've got to mention the, the, the jargon for the method that you see in galaxies are called baryons. Baryons, for obvious reasons for physicists, and to distinguish it from dark matter for those who believe in it. So baryons stand for just the visible matter in all forms. And uh, as you can see, this little arrow is much smaller than this big arrow, which means that there's something missing. And what is missing is this uh, subject of contention for many years now. On one <coughs> hand, the main frame of the main, sorry, mainstream solution to this problem is to invoke large quantities of, of additional matter, called dark matter, which has to be present in those systems in just the right quantities and distribution to account for the missing uh, gravity, so to say. Uh, 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 quantitatively, what you, what you need is, is a factor of between one and sometimes going up to a hundred times. So it's not a small effect. It's not uh, like a few percent, not a few tens of percent. It is true that in some the centers of some galaxies, the discrepancy does not show up, so there is agreement, but as you go to larger radii, the discrepancy appears at some radius and then increases and increases, and, and the further you go, the, the larger the discrepancy is, as far as, as you can go. And if you can go far enough, you can reach even discrepancies of a factor of 100. So these are very large discrepancies. Right. Okay, so. Right, so, so this, this poses the question, what, what, what is the, what is the under, underlying cause for this, uh, for this discrepancy? Is it dark matter? Most people think it, it is dark matter. I mean, uh, of course, opinions also have changed a lot from, from the time I started this. Uh, as Uzi mentioned already, initially there was more uh, uh, disregard, more than... Uh, but I, I certainly feel that over the years, uh, balance is changing, and for good reasons. I mean, uh, so dark matter, uh, you, you can say good things about dark matter, you can say bad things about dark matter. I, I would, will not say any, really. <laughs> I do have one transparency with the bad things, but I decided in the end to, to not, not to discuss this. But, but one thing I do want to say is that um, dark matter 
cannot be any sort of matter that is known to science. I mean, there's nothing that we know that exists that can be the dark matter. Over the years, many candidates have been suggested, but they have been ruled out <coughs> one by one. And today, uh, okay, formally what this means is there is the standard model of particle physics, which supposedly accounts for all possible forms of matter that we know. <coughs> and non, non, nothing that is within the standard model can be the dark matter for different reasons. And so what happens now is that uh, people come up with different, uh, um, I should call them speculations, but they are really educated possibilities of what extension of the standard model there could be. And in some of them, there are new particles that might or might not exist, and some of them might be or might not be the dark matter. But I, I took uh, this, this, this other folk many years ago when all this was not even realized because at the time there were good candidates for dark matter, I mean, uh, uh, just re reasonable, more reasonable candidates for dark matter. Okay, so far for the appearance of, uh, of anomalies in, in galactic systems, but such anomalies appear also in, in cosmology. So cosmology is taking care of uh, describing the universe at large as one system. And there, you, you may know that the universe is expanding, that is a, a fact. And the way it expands depends on its material content, whether it's a radiation field, or whether it's a massive particles or non-relativistic particles, because when the universe expands, different types of matter behave differently. And this, in turn, affects the way the universe expands, so it's a, it's a, it's a circular system. And so, from, by measuring the way the universe expands, we know, we think we know what, what is the content of what type of things. And there too, you need, you need some, uh, the, the, the observed matter is not enough. But in the context of the universe, there is even a larger mystery that has to do with the fact that whether it's dark matter or baryons or, or normal matter, they would cause the expansion of the universe to slow down because they all attract, they all. <laughs> dark matter or baryons are just sort of normal matter in the sense of gravity at least, so they pull. And so they would cause the universe, uh, the expansion of the universe to slow down. In fact, it has been uh, measured in the 90s that the expansion of the universe accelerates. So it cannot be dark matter that does this, so we need some other component. It's called dark energy, it's even more mysterious. We, and it constitutes some 70% of the content of the universe. So it, again, it's not, not, not a little matter. Anyway, so as I said, I took the, the other four. Yeah, in the context of the universe, what you need is roughly uh, on, only about a factor of six uh, total matter than, than, uh, than standard matter. It's quite different from what happens in galaxies. Okay, so this is Mond. Mond uh, originally stood for modified Newtonian dynamics, but it, over the years it, it has attained a, a larger scope, really, because, for example, with the advent of uh, relativistic theories and so on. So it's, but the, main, the name stuck, as usually happens, the first name. And it's, it sounds good, I think. <laughs> so, uh, right, so, because I, I will really not be able to cover uh, even a small part of this. <coughs> so I, I, I'm giving you, I'm starting with some synopsis of this. So first of all, okay, you want to come and say that uh, uh, the, the cause for this anomaly is not the presence of dark matter, but it's a breakdown of Newtonian dynamics of relativity when it is needed uh, in the realm of those systems. And this is the cause. I mean, the anomaly arises because you're using standard dynamics, for example, to calculate the gravitational force. Suppose that you are doing it the wrong way, and there's another way to do it more correctly, and that will give you the, the force without invoking dark matter. So that, that's the idea. But of course, Newtonian dynamics and relative, uh, relativity have had many successes for hundreds of years, for, for Newtonian dynamics at least. So you don't want to throw this into the... Yeah, but it always happens when you introduce a, a, a new CO, you, you do want to retain the success of the old one. So you are looking for, for a property of the, those <coughs> systems that you are going to try to explain that differs much from those where the, the, the old COE has been tested, the solar system and the, and, and the lab in our case. 
after you know looking the uh, scrutinizing a list of properties i in the end um, uh, pinpointed the, the acceleration as the important quantity and this was based on the fact that accelerations in galactic systems are much much are many orders of magnitude smaller than what, than what you encounter in the solar system or in the lab so just as an example here uh, for example the earth goes at, is, at, is attracted to the sun with a gravitational uh, acceleration force per unit mass, which is eight orders of magnitude larger than that of the sun in the galaxy, which is typical for galaxies. Okay, so, so, so Mon is built on the idea that you need to modify standard dynamics in the limit of very small accelerations. What is small? You have to introduce some uh, new constant, okay, which, which marks the, 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 the limits, the boundary between validity domain of standard dynamics and the new dynamics. And because it hinges on acceleration, this constant has dimensions of acceleration. And the idea would be that, that acceleration much higher than this uh, uh, standard dynamics is restored, while at low acceleration, something else happens. And this something else is, is the novelty here. And it, the statement is that at low accelerations, uh, you want your COE to become scale invariant, in a sense that you, you, you will hopefully understand in a minute. It's an important thing, um, but I just wanted here to say that so, so the idea is, is founded on some uh, symmetry principle. Um, right. Okay. Uh, another thing that I want to say is that Mond has, from the start, predicted a large number of not only uh, general laws like uh, an analog of Kepler's laws general uh, regularities and, and, and laws, but also you, you, you can predict uh, the behavior of in individual systems, which I should say maybe at this point that dark matter cannot do, for reasons that I may, may or may not uh, expand, expand on later. But, but, and this is done with essentially no free parameters. I mean, you have the theory, it predicts things, you go and check them. And yes, they, they have been checked and, and uh, vindicated, in fact. Like any good theory, it is not completely free of problems. Okay. Yeah, they say that, that the correct word theory is one, one of the indications is that it can explain everything. So we haven't yet been able to explain everything. There is, when you when, try to account for the anomalies in uh, galaxy clusters, Mon does correct a lot the discrepancy, but it still leaves systematically uh, some discrepancy of about a factor of two, typically. Also, as regards cosmology, so if, it, if I was talking, uh, let's say, half a year ago, I would say this, not yet a coherent picture of cosmology, but as it happens many times, just in time for my colloquium, uh, <laughs> the, the, it's a bit uh, awkward to, to say this, uh, that, you know, uh, th there have been ve very interesting work on, on accounting for, for cosmology and the uh, cosmic microwave background uh, <coughs> in, in a Monsio, in a relativistic Monsio. It, it's happening now, basically, so there isn't even a paper yet on this, but I, it's, uh, it, it, it's by Scordis and Sloznik, a person whom I know for a long time. He has been working on, on relativistic theories for a long time. And, uh, I, I think is, is right, still needs to be checked and so on. Anyway, independent of this issue, there, there, there are indications that Mon is tightly connected with cosmology in some way that I'll explain. Um, that there are several full-fledged theories of Mon. Uh, full-fledged, I mean, derived from an action. Theories that you can use to calculate, in principle, anything that you want, not just a set of rules. And, um, but, but I, I will say hardly anything about, about COEs. Because, uh, right. So the basic tenets of Mond, again, repeating slightly what I said already, but in more, more formally. So as I said, it's, uh, it's, it's, what, what would be a Mond, uh, a Mond COE? Uh, the theory of dynamics, and, uh, which includes gravity and inertia, that involves a new constant, A0. You want, I said that already, some something analogous to the correspondence principle in quantum mechanics, namely that, that when all, all parameters in the system of dimensions of acceleration are much larger than A0, you want Newtonian dynamic to be uh, 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 highly accurate. 
Now, formally, you can do this by looking at an equation of the theory <laughs> and, and simply send A0 to 0. So A0 will appear in some results of the theory. So you say, okay, let's, let's take A0 a, a zero to 0. This should give you an equation that is correct in Newtonian dynamics. And in the opposite limit, which is, again, formally, you, you take A0 to infinity. So, uh, so I should say, uh, okay, you take A0 to infinity. Again, for, for formal reasons, I will not enter. You also have to take G of Newton to 0, such that G times A0 is fixed. And it is a new constant that appears in this, in this limit. So in this limit, you want the theory to become scale invariant. Again, bear with me a little bit. Scale invariance means that if you take uh, the theory should be invariant under inflating all distances and all times involved by the same factor. Okay, so, um, and perhaps for, to, to, to make all this more palatable, uh, I, I can use an analogy if you, again, think of A0. So A0 in quantum mechanics and C in, in relativity play a similar role. <coughs> Similar roles, in fact, there are several roles. So, first of all, they, they, they mark the boundary of the validity domain, let's say, between classical and quantum physics. They also disappear in the, in the classical physics, in the, in the theory where, uh, in the case of, of, of quantum, h bar goes to zero. For relativity, you take c to infinity to get classical physics. But they do appear ubiquitously, they appear in many phenomena in, in the modified regime. So, right, like h bar appears in in, uh, in, in, in many quantum phenomena, A0 appears in quite a few uh, phenomena. And, okay, so in a way of, of uh, explanation, a few words about what is meant by scale invariant. So, of course, scale invariant means that the theory itself, the equations of the theory, have to remain the same when you apply <coughs> the, the, the symmetry operations on the, the, the so-called degrees of freedom, on, on the quantities that describe the system. In this case, take all, multiply all, all, all lengths, all radii by a factor and all times by the same factor. But, but it is more transparent, I think, to explain this in terms of not what happens to the theory or to the equations, but to, to the solutions. So by the same token, um, a symmetry of the theory means that if you take any solution, a valid solution of the theory, you apply the operation of the symmetry on the solution, you get another something that is also a solution. That's essentially equivalent. And this is easy also to, to, to visualize. So consider, for example, some system here, which can be a galaxy or clusters of, a cluster of galaxies, a self-gravitating system with many, many um, masses, and consider its full-time history. So there would be a solution of whatever theory you think is correct. Now consider another system Okay, which at time, at an, another time, times that is, uh, let's say, b times, uh, sorry, a b times t, let's say five times the, the, the time at which you are looking at this system, has all sizes five times larger, and follow it in time in this way, and you get another history of another system that is also a solution. An important thing is that velocities don't change in this operation. Velocity is length over time, so this operation doesn't change velocity. Okay. Uh, <coughs> it's just to say that Newtonian dynamics is not scale invariant, and we see how it is scale invariant. And okay. right. So again, to take home some uh, sort of, uh, not quite a caricature, but uh, some, some, uh, some examples. So let, let's suppose we have a central mass, and we want to know what does this theory tell us, tell, tell us about the uh, gravitational field or gravitational force that this mass produces on a small test particle. So if you are near the mass, <laughs> If you are near the mass, this is just a, for those who cannot see the acceleration as a function of the radius for different masses. Each color here is a different, this is typical of a star, a globular cluster, a galaxy of a galaxy cluster. What happens? When you are near the mass, the force is just Newtonian, so it goes down like 1 over r squared. <laughs> then it reaches a certain radius, and it breaks into another behavior, which is like 1 over r. This, this results from scale invariant. You can easily convince yourself. 
Yeah, maybe I have to, to explain this. So, so you take a planet around, around the sun, but the system is scale invariant. So apply this, this <coughs> symmetry operation and multiply everything by a factor of 10. So you, you get a, another a planet that is revolving at, at an orbital radius, which is 10 times the, the initial one. But also the time, the orbital time, it takes, is, is 10 times larger. So the, its velocity is the same. So this means that the velocity in such a system is independent of the radius. So there you are, just immediately one result of scale invariance, which is that the rotational speed around the mass when you go far enough from the mass, it becomes independent of, of, the, of the radius. Okay, so, so anyway, but, okay, so, so I said, for a given mass, you start at small radii with Newtonian dynamics, at some radius it breaks into an, one over r force, but this does not happen at the same radius for all systems, that, that break radius depends on the, on the mass, and, what, what is the same, what is universal, is the acceleration at which this happens. So that's a, one way to, to remember things. Okay, so I, I, I have to say that it many times happens that many important theories start with, with only ideas, without really having a full, full-fledged theory. So, for example, general relativity started with, with um, equivalence principle, with elevator, the Duncan experiment by, by Einstein which already, even without having a theory, gave rise to, to quite a few very strong predictions. And in quantum mechanics, we know that there have been many phenomena that have been studied and explained before the advent of, uh, let's say, Schrodinger's uh, equation or Heisenberg's uh, matrix mechanics, which would constitute a theory. But there, there is a lot that you can do even before you have a theory. And this is also the case here, just from those ba basic principles that I explained, you can already uh, derive several corollaries that uh, even without having a specific full-fledged theory, and I've listed some of them here, they're, they're, it's only a partial list. Um, so, for example, the, the, this one I already <coughs> mentioned, that uh, you, you expect the velocity, the orbital velocity around any mass to become constant as... Uh, you go to large radii. Here in parentheses, I indicated that the analog in, in Newtonian dynamics where, where, where it exists. So, so this is just Kepler's uh, uh, third law, that the way the, basically the, the orbital time of a planet uh, <coughs> depends on, on its radius. But it, 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 it is tantamount to saying that the velocity, the orbital velocity goes down, down like one over square root of r, whereas here it should go like constant. This K is Kepler's constant. Okay, Kepler only knew about the solar system, so he didn't uh, try to see how this constant depends on, on the mass of the sun or things like this. But now we know, by studying many other systems, that this constant goes like square root of mg in Newtonian dynamics. Here, you can also determine the, the, this asymptotic uh, constant speed just from the central mass. And, and Mond predicts this related this very strong relation. And there are other like, like this, maybe I, I don't have so much time uh, discussing them. There are also predictions that do not have analogs in standard dynamics, simply because, okay, for example, uh, one obvious one is that if you look at one system and you study the way the, the, the anomaly or the discrepancy if de develops as you go from inside, outside. So the prediction, of course, is that the, the discrepancy will always appear at the same value of the acceleration in all systems. And so these are some other examples. But they, they all have to do with, uh, you see, once A not appear in the prediction uh, here, uh, or in fact, in, in many of them. But anyway, the, the, this concern either the transition, which of course does not occur in Newtonian dynamics, so, so um, there aren't any analogs to this. But, right. Okay. Um, I, I, I want to, to emphasize some generalities about this relation because there, there are some important uh, things. Right. So, so, so it's a list of, uh, of predictions, and there are more of them. But it is, uh, it is good to take a step back and to think about some general 
uh, properties of this. And so one thing is, uh, as I already mentioned, that they are all predicted, well, they were predicted a priori by Mond, and they were sub sub subsequently verified, okay, in the sense that they were not post-diction, they were really predictions. And uh, so I say in the list that e even if dark matter is eventually discovered and it turned out that all this is not a result of uh, modified dynamics, it is still to the credit of Mond that it has discovered really new laws of galactic dynamics that were not known before. So at least this, uh, this, this achievement exists. And this appearance of A0 in the data is also quite clear. So A0, for some reason or other, does appear in the data. <coughs> so, okay, it is also important to realize when you do discuss this, uh, this paradigm struggle <coughs> and, and whatever, which is it's interesting to, to hear about these uh, interesting aspects of, of this and all the polemics that goes back and forth between the two fields and so on. Interesting, but I will not discuss it here. But one, one element of the polemics is the, to indicate that the dark matter paradigm has not predicted or anticipated any of these laws. Okay. Yeah. The value of A0 given by different measurements always amounts to the same value? I wouldn't be here otherwise, yes. <laughs> yes, I, it's the next transparency, but of course, yes. So it is also uh, quite reassuring that, that uh, I can say this at this point already, that, that the different, um, it, it, you know, I, I, I discussed before the, the analog with quantum mechanics, so if, even before, before there was an umbrella theory for quantum mechanics, so it all started with the black body spectrum, we know, and then several years later, the photoelectric effect, and then the Balmer series, and the Bohr atom, and, and the specific heat of solids, and so on and so forth. So all, all these were phenomena in which H bar or H appeared, okay? But in a way that did not really connect them, you could not understand one of these phenomena um, by understanding the others. It was only the umbrella of, of, uh, of quantum mechanics that shows them to be parts of the same uh, construct, of the same theorem. And, and uh, I know from reading that people saw the fact that H bar ap appearing in all these phenomena and having the same value as a very strong indication that there is such a, an underlying theory. So that, that is also the case here. Yeah. Right, so I already said that th these predictions follow essentially from only the basic tenets that I listed before. So this is, in a way, a blessing because it means that any theory that will embody these basic tenets will also automatically make these predictions. So uh, that's good, but on the other hand, it makes it difficult to distinguish between theories because all that you inquire, the, all those uh, salient uh, uh, predictions uh, almost all that you can measure, it's very, very difficult in, in astronomy to go beyond this very basic thing. So it is uh, still, that is why when I said before we have quite a few non-COs, why is it that uh, we have several? It's usually not a good sign, but in this case it is because you can write COs that embody these uh, basic tenets and they will automatically satisfy those uh, major uh, predictions and, and so, okay, it's difficult to distinguish between them. I, I said and already with, with, uh, with uh, harking back to what happened in, in uh, quantum mechanics that these phenomenological laws are independent in the sense that even if you assume that three of them hold somehow, it doesn't mean that the fourth or fifth will hold. So they are independent in some sense. And importantly, yes, they revolve around A0, which appears in them in, in several roles, and, and, um, and you, you determine A0. Uh, from all of them, and you get the same, essentially the same value within errors, and this value is, is this, which is about uh, one angstrom per second square. So, uh, one important thing to note about just this, numer this number, and it has been realized right from the outset, really, that it has some cosmological connotation. So, for example, if you accelerate with this acceleration, from, from the Big Bang, from the, uh, over the lifetime of the universe, you reach the speed of light, essentially. So that's the connection. Uh, that's the way to remember it. Formally, it, it is that, that A naught is roughly s s uh, C, speed of light, times so-called Hubble constant. 
Today we call it the Hubble Lemaitre constant because it was discovered that Lemaitre even anticipated Hubble in this, but anyway. So it, it, it's essentially the expansion rate of the universe, which is uh, one over roughly one of the li lifetime of the universe since the Hubble time. And also, I mentioned before the, the issue of, of dark energy that we, we think it's a so-called cosmological constant. I'm not going to explain exactly what it is, but it is a, a, some, a, a constant uh, energy density that uh, uh, is present in the universe and that causes this accelerated expansion that I mentioned before. It's a very important uh, cosmological parameter and it, it, it is of, of uh, units of uh, one over length square, so c squared times square root of lambda, it's an acceleration associated with this uh, cosmological concept. Numerically, it is very near, uh, near the value of, of this A0. So what do we make of this, this, this uh, coincidence? We can just ignore it as many times, but, but uh, um, history taught us that sometimes it's good to take care of your, of your coincidence. Let's call it a coincidence for now. So question is, shall we take it seriously? Is it just a coincidence? Is it, is it really pointing to some deep underlying theory? And I believe that it, that it, that it does, because um, so for, for one thing, it's not just a coincidence between things that do not appear related. I was going to say this are probably related, but uh, <laughs> the, the diameter of Rehovot and the, the height of Mount Everest, so several kilometers. We know it's, it's not telling us anything, right? But here, I think it is telling us something important because, first of all, <coughs> this, the, the, this constant that appear in this relation um, are all appearing, uh, are all related to gravity and they are, they are all uh, connected with these anomalies that appear. So there's a good chance that they, it's not just a coincidence. The other thing is that, in fact, we do have possible explanation of, of this relation in some one's years. Okay, so that this is uh, why I think it is a, an important hint. And if we do take it as a hint, it is telling us that uh, there is a deeper theory, that Mond, as we now know it, or as we describe it, is only what we call an effective, an emergent theory from some theory at the deeper stratum that is uh, more fundamental, and that somehow we will understand one day why this relation uh, appears. Right, I, I was... I thought was thinking of maybe saying a few words about this, but let me just leave you with this titillating, uh, intriguing. Uh, yeah, but, but maybe I should say people sometimes ask oh, why acceleration? Why, why is this? Uh, why should why, why should there be a break in physics when going from uh, over some acceleration session? We're used to things happening at long distances, small distances. Uh, why, why is it an acceleration? So. So in fact, um, yeah, if you have a system with some acceleration a, you can attach to it a meaningful length, which is c square over a. So dimensionally, um, yes, what I wrote is, is the following. Okay, you can use a naught to, to define some lengths. Let's call it the mond length, which is just c square over a. This is from dimensions. And, and the statement above here just means that this length is of the order of the size of the universe today. So, so uh, you can say, and on the other hand, if you have a system with, with moving with acceleration A, it has uh, attached to it some meaningful radius or some mean, meaningful length, which is C square over A, that appears in different contexts. Um, okay, I, I won't discuss it right now, but I'm just, I just want to say that to say that you're dealing with an acceleration much larger than A0 means that this radius, this, this length that is attached to the acceleration is much smaller than the radius of the universe. <laughs> in some sense, you can show that the system with acceleration A is probing, in some sense, is probing a distance LA. So for accelerations much larger than A0, you are saying I, we are probing distances with, that are much smaller than the size of the universe, so we are not sensitive, we are not really aware of the non-trivial structure of the universe. For example, that it's not flat, that it has a cosmological constant and so on. Whereas when the accelerations are much smaller than A0 or smaller, you are probing distances of the order of the universe or larger 
and there are ways to, to actually make this uh, happen. And uh, this can give rise to some, some of the explanations for, for this solution. Yes. Uh, okay, so I, I was not meaning to talk about COs, but just if you wonder what, what a mon COE can look like. Uh, so, so, for example, uh, let's say I want to modify gravity. And gravity in standard dynamics, Newtonian gravity tells us that the density of matter determines the gravitational potential phi through the Poisson equation. <coughs> and if you want a mod like COE, you need to modify this to look like an equation for, uh, okay, for it, it looks like an equation for a dielectric medium in which the dielectric constant depends on the field strength. So a lot of you recognize it. So there is some mu here which plays the role of it, like a dielectric constant, and it is a function of the field strength. And it has grad phi over A0 in it. And so in the limit where A0 goes to 0, this mu has to go to 1. And you restore, you restore the Poisson equation, standard dynamic. In the opposite limit, scale invariance dictates some behavior. And then you get mod. And uh, it, it is this theory, for example, is, is derivable from an action. So it has all the standard uh, uh, conservation laws, from Nettle theorem, from the symmetries, and so on. It, it satisfies. It is also a limit of mon relativistic theory. So it, it looks like a good theory. So it's one of the theories that we use for calculations, for, for predictions. For. Okay. I, I'll now come in the, in the time that's left to discuss some phenomenology, some uh, some actual data, comparison with predictions of mon, and so on. Now, the, 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 the flagship the, the, of, of MON testing and the, the, the queen of, of, of these dynamics are what I called the earlier rotation curves of these galaxies. And by far, they, they, they afford the best study of this problem. Now, I want to explain in a few words why this is so. So what are we doing when we measure rotation curve? We look at the galaxy. A galaxy is circular, of course, intrinsically, but on the sky it is tilted. So we see it as a, an elliptical structure. From the ellipticity, for example, we can, we can know what, what its inclination is. And then we, we measure the velocity along the line of sight using Doppler effect, of course, at many points in, in the full area of the galaxy. Okay, so well, we can only measure line of sight velocities. Doppler only gives us this one component of the velocity along the line of sight. But we can convert it into a Velocity as a function of radius, a full velocity in y. So what, what are, the, what are the, 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 the attributes, the properties that make this, uh, this, this uh, analysis the best? So first of all, importantly, you know exactly where you measure the velocity. Because, because the, the galaxy is, is, uh, is, so, is so thin, the line of sight pierces the galaxy only at one point. So you know we are measuring the velocity at this point. Whereas if you are measuring in, in an elliptical galaxy, let's say, that has a thickness comparable with its size, you don't really know where you are measuring the velocity along the line of sight. So sometimes you just integrate, you get some integrated quantities. Sometimes you, you measure individual ones, but you don't know where it is. So that's an important, important thing. So when you map the field, you want to know where you are measuring. The other thing is that Indeed, you measure only one-dimensional velocities, but in the case of, the, of, uh, of these galaxies, you know exactly the orbit. You know that the orbit is circular, and for every point, you know in which direction the velocity is. So just one component gives you the full three-dimensional velocity. Not so for any other system where you don't know. You, you only have one component. You don't know the orbit. You have to guess. You have to make assumptions. The other thing is, the, the third thing is that indeed, because, again, because you know the orbit, you can convert velocities directly to accelerations. So, like I said before, you don't measure accel accelerations. You measure velocities. If you know the radius of curvature of the orbit, you can calculate the acceleration. Again, you cannot do this in general. And the fourth thing that I could come up with, and maybe others, is that uh, these galaxies have Generically, they have very extended, very large 
disk of gas that goes beyond, far beyond where the stars are. And far beyond even where this, this, uh, this gas contributes to the mass itself, but it does provide us with test particles that go far, and that allow us to measure rotation curves to large distances, large radii in the galaxy. <coughs> Again, in for the case of elliptical galaxies, for example, we can hardly do this. We, we can measure velocities of stars in the galaxy, so we can map gravitational field only inside where the stars are. So that is why the rotation curves have become the baby, my baby, of the people who study this problem. And I will now just show you some data. Right, so I start with five. I'll show you many more because I think in this, in this case, quantity is quality. Uh, uh, this kind of analysis has been done for over 200 galaxies. So you can do it, you know, the galaxy has to be near enough. You have to be able to, to measure distribution of, of, the, of the mass in the galaxies, of the gas, of the stars. You have to be able to have good, yes, some of these, these galaxies are not really that quiet. They are not so rotating so nicely. They have disturbances, so you cannot make much sense of them. So you need galaxies that uh, are behaved and so on. So even though there are you know, billions of such galaxies, the analysis has uh, been carried out only for, for a few hundreds of them, but it's still a large number. So these are some, uh, some typical, uh, typical cases of, of galaxies of different types. Um, okay, so what, is, what do we see here? It's a, it is a measure rotational velocity as a function of radius. The, the data points are the data points, of course. The, the, the line that usually, like this, in this case, is what you would expect for the velocity to be from the gravitational field of the visible matter alone. So you, you also, as I said before, you, you map the distribution of, of visible matter. You calculate from <coughs> Newtonian dynamics the expected velocity. So for example, in this case, the, the last measured point here, the velocity, the expected velocity is 50, and what you see is 140. It's about a factor of three larger, but the, the, the acceleration go like this square. The masses also go like this square. So this bespe bespeaks a, a, a mass discrepancy of a factor of nine, roughly, at, at, at the last uh, measured point. You can also see that inside, the, it starts with no discrepancy. The discrepancy develops. So that, that's the same one here. Here there are two curves because they give the, separately the contribution of uh, the gas and, and the stars, but the stars dominate here. And you are all asking, what is this line that does go through the data points, of course? So it, it's, it is the prediction of Mond. So you use Mond to predict. So essentially you say, I, I use the, the visible matter. The visible matter predicts this line for, in Newtonian dynamics. So this line, and in Mond, it predicts this line. And it is a prediction, I have to say. In some cases, th there is a one parameter fit, because uh, I mentioned before that we need to convert stellar light to stellar mass. And the, part, the, the conversion factor, which we call mass to light ratio, is known to be in a roughly a factor <coughs> of two. But uh, it does not be known. Uh, uh, it can vary from galaxy to galaxy. It's not, it's not the same. But, but uh, we have some control over this, but not full control. So, for example, here, uh, this parameter has been fixed just to fit the inner data points, and, but the rest is a prediction. It's a parameter but less prediction. In many cases, the, the, it, is a, it is a completely parameter-free prediction. For example, if, if, the, if, if, the, if the contribution to the baryonic mass is dominated by gas, the gas can be determined directly, the gas mass, without having to convert from anything. There's no free parameter involved. So in those cases, such, such as here, for example, it is a full prediction. And uh, if I had more time, I would say something about those features that are also reproduced correctly. And uh, it's, I think it's a very important issue. So I just, now I'll just flash some, some uh, not some, many more such <laughs> such a uh, thing, but I will not say anything about them. They are just taken from different analyses over the years. It's, it's, it's already 35 years since the first analysis has been conducted. So you, you, it's, it's the same story all over. So again, data points, Newtonian curve, <coughs> the Mond curve, 
and this girl is taken from some reviews, it's another, another review, an earlier review. So there are, there are, uh, there are, there are, there are, there are uh, problematic cases, okay, so. But you can, you can, individual, individual cases, you can always impute to problems with observations. The prediction itself is, is a prediction also that is based on observations, right? Because it is based on the distribution of, of the matter. It, it, it needs to know the distance to the galaxy. If, if the distance to the galaxy, which is determined from independent uh, analysis, is wrong, the prediction will be wrong. Okay? It doesn't scale with it. So I just... <laughs> no, this is just a, some very recent analysis of actually over 200 galaxies, but I, I'm just showing the, so they, they, they have marks of quality, and these are essentially the, 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 the 100 higher quality cases. Okay, this is in a sense a, a summary of, of, of those rotation curves. So what is done here, which it's an early one using 73 galaxies, and what you plot is the measured velocity over the baryonic velocity, which are those two velocities, squared, as I said before, the acceleration goes like the square of it, plotted as a function of the acceleration, of the Newtonian acceleration, and the predictions of Mond are this, essentially these two asymptotic lines. So at high accelerations, you expect V over V baryonic to be one, and, and here scaling variance and so on, dictates this line and, and in fact you can read a, a zero from this from this curve in three different ways because it appears in, in three different roles so f first of all it is more or less the intersect of the two of the two asymptotes and, and in this branch also it appears in two different ways so that, uh, again for reasons I don't have time to, to discuss uh, this is a similar uh, an analog analysis not using uh, rotation curves, but using, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, a gas cloud that, that uh, surrounds these uh, two elliptical galaxies and assuming hydrostatic equilibrium, you determine the pressure distribution in the gas, you, you, you <coughs> equate the pressure forces with gravitational forces, and in this way you get a map of the gravitational field, again, what is measured, what is, what is predicted, this is a very general summary of, of many uh, uh, spherical systems, so not, not disks, not disk galaxies, but uh, it includes elliptical galaxies and, and, and other things, but, but it's uh, statistical, so each, each data point is not one measurement, but it is really a, a binning of a lot of data. If you put the individual data points, you'll see a lot of scatter around this, because as I mentioned before, those spherical systems, unlike this, do not afford a very accurate analysis, so you do expect a lot of, a lot of scatter. Um, this is very quickly just to show that uh, indeed rotation curves of many galaxies <coughs> are asymptotically flat. You, you could have seen, I'm not sure you noticed this, in all those many panels that I showed before of rotation curves, but it's just <coughs> uh, collected here on one plot. Um, if you remember, which you probably not, uh, there was one, one strong prediction of Mond that says that the asymptotic constant rotational speed around the galaxy should be uh, only a function of the total baryonic mass of this galaxy. And the prediction was that uh, the, 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 the velocity was like the force, part, the force root of the mass. So the, this, these are diff uh, two different analyses. Uh, this is a plot of the scatter to show that the, the scatter that you see in the data is consistent with it all being due to intrinsic scatter, um, in, uh, sorry, in, uh, measurement scatter, so it's consistent with zero in, in, intrinsic scatter. Uh, this is another law that is predicted. Again, uh, okay, so <coughs> I think it's quite uh, clear that, that Mon, uh, Mon, Mon does a lot and he does it very well. And the uh, question is what, what you make of it. But, okay. uh, yeah. 
but there, there are also issues with my letter, as I wrote. So over the many years that have elapsed since I started with this, there were many uh, claims. Here is a problem. Here is a problem. Here is a problem. Here is a galaxy that doesn't conform with Mond and so on. So I tend to, uh, I shouldn't say ignore, but I, I tend not to take this seriously because, you know, this is a, after all astronomy. And astronomy is, is really beset with many issues, I mean, systematics. And uh, I, I heard someone laughing here, but uh, of course it's true, it has done a lot. Astronomy has advanced in huge steps, but uh, still, Individual cases do not pose problems. More, more so because over the years, many of these problems that we pointed out actually went away with better data and so on. So there still exist some such galaxies, and I'll show you some that you could say, taken in itself, it, it poses a problem. But you know, in the back of our mind, we know, don't worry, I mean, there are possible explanations. But there are two issues that are nagging and that are still with us. And one is the issue of clusters. So in clusters of galaxies, we do this analysis. Here's a plot, it's a bit older one, but uh, things haven't changed much, really, since then. So you plot, here's the dynamical mass. Dyna by dynamical mass, we mean the total mass that within Newtonian dynamics is required to balance the observed acceleration. Okay? So it's the for those who believe in dark matter, it's the mass of the baryons plus dark matter. And this is the mass that we actually observe. And you see, when we apply Newtonian dynamics, we get a factor of about uh, seven, let's say, slightly less than an order of magnitude. Now, when you apply MOND instead, all those points go down, which means that the discrepancy has not disappeared completely, but has decreased. And you are still left systematically with a discrepancy of a factor of two. <coughs> what to make of it, we don't know. There might be explanations for that. For example, we may have not discovered all the baryonic matter that uh, reside in the clusters. It's, it's a possibility. And, uh, you know, some people suggested massive neutrinos. Neutrinos that are not massive do not contribute. I mean, unless, unless they are like 10 electron volts. So, I think this has been ruled out for standard neutrinos, but people are talking about sterile neutrinos. But anyway, it, it is a, still a, a standing problem. Some people try to modify MOND in a way that will also accommodate this. I don't like this at all. <coughs> I don't think it is time to, to do this. Uh, but the same token for those of you who heard about the bullet cluster, I'm not going to explain what it is, but it, it, it turns out to be the same kind of problem, so it doesn't really help. Anything like this. And the other thing is cosmology. As I said, we still don't have really, barring this uh, new work that just uh, is going to appear next week, uh, literally. Uh, uh, so, so barring this, if we know this for a moment, we still have uh, an issue with cosmology. But in what sense, how is cosmology treated in, in, in relativity? So we first had the theory of relativity. And then we use relativity to describe cosmology. So cosmology is treated as one system to be described within general relativity. Now here, because of this connection of A0 with, Mond, with uh, cosmology, my own belief is that this is not going to happen here. That Mond and cosmology will have to be understood as two aspects of the same con construct. That we will need some umbrella theory that will explain both. In, so, so the way people tried so far to explain cosmology by first writing a mon, uh, relativistic mon theory and then accounting for cosmology within this, I, I personally feel that it's a question of taste, but yeah, I, that it's not really the right way to go. And, uh, right in time, I'm here for the summary. Uh, again, Mond is still under construction. I've been saying this for many years, so this <laughs> statement appears in many of my talks, but... Uh, it is, uh, it is less so, but still so. And uh, it is, that just to remind you, which is a nice feature, it is anchored in, in symmetry. So initially, it is a realization that occurred later in, in the life of the theory. So initially, it did look somewhat ad hoc, just something to explain the data. But now I feel a little more, more, more safe about this. Uh, 
Uh, it has several, quite a few theoretical directions. As I said, it achieves a lot. What it does achieve, it, it, it does very well, but uh, it doesn't yet account for everything. Thank you very much. <laughs>